you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast, the hottest, hottest podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. And now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Wait, that's me. Hey, guys, uh, welcome to the Chris Voss Show, <laughs> the Chris Voss Show.com. I'm never going to make it an opera with that voice. Anyway, guys, you seem to love it, so we just keep doing it all these years. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to go to refer the show to your friends, neighbors, relatives. Uh, get them all going on to the biggest family in the world that loves you but doesn't judge you, the Chris Voss Show podcast. Go to YouTube.com for chess Chris Voss. See everything we're doing over there. Hit the bell notification button. You hit that little ding, that bell button. It fulfills much of the things you've been missing in your life, gives you a feeling that will wash over you of completeness or at least disappointment. Uh, one of those two. But at least you'll feel something. And for some people, that's good. I don't know. Just just roll with it. Trust me. The attorney said I can say that. Go to goodreads.com. Fortress Chris Voss. It's over there, wherever I pointed. Goodreads.com. Fortress Chris Voss. Everything we're reading or viewing over there as well. Go to all of our groups. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Check out that LinkedIn newsletter. That thing's killing it over there. It's growing like a monster. I probably should stop watering it. It sounds like a movie or something. Anyway, also go to the big 132,000 group on LinkedIn as well. That's uh, kind of fun to be on uh, involved. So we're excited to announce my new book is coming out. It's called Beacons of Leadership, Inspiring Lessons of Success in Business and Innovation. It's going to be coming out on October 5th, 2021. And I'm really excited for you to get a chance to read this book. It's filled with a multitude of my insightful stories, lessons, my life, and experiences in leadership and character. I give you some of the secrets from my CEO entrepreneurial toolbox that I use to scale my business success, innovate, and build a multitude of companies. I've been a CEO for uh, what is it like uh, 33 35 years now we talk about leadership the importance of leadership how to become a great leader and how anyone can become a great leader as well or order the book wherever fine books are sold today we have another amazing author on the show i don't know where they keep coming from we just have these uh, great publishing houses that send us these amazing brilliant people and we just go oh my gosh we should have those folks in the show and what do you know they show up with the latest technology that's been available just just came out this year i think and we're able to talk to them about their stuff and what they're doing. Today, we have John Gilstrap on the show with us. He is a very prolific author. If you're not already aware of him, you should be. You should put him on your list. He is the author of his newest book that's come out February 22, 2022. For those of you who may have seen this 10 years from now, the book is called Blue Fire, a riveting new thriller. This is part of his Victorian Emerson thriller series from my understanding and all that good stuff. So he's going to be talking to us about his book and everything that's gone in between with it. He is a New York Times bestselling author of award-winning action novels, including the Jonathan Grave thrillers and the Victoria Emerson series. He's a master of action-driven suspense, and he's touted as one of the most accomplished thriller writers on the planet and he i'm actually the one who's uh, not the least accomplished thriller on the planet myself but no it's just an, that's just a joke i don't even do thrillers what am i doing i'm just having fun with your bio john my uh, apologies there his books though have been translated into more than 20 languages he is the recipient of an international thriller writers award against all enemies and two time itw award finalists he won the ALA Alex Award for Nathan's Run, which was optioned for a film by Warner Brothers, a nationally recognized weaponry and explosive safety experts. I've got a bomb. I need them to deconstruct. Uh, it's a couple ex-wives. John frequently speaks at conferences, events, clubs, youth programs, and military bases, which probably helps with that weaponized uh, experience. He is a former firefighter and EMT with a master's degree in safety from the University of SoCal and a bachelor's degree in history from the College of William and Mary in Virginia. Wow, he's done everything. Is there anything that you haven't done, John? Well, <clears throat> at the end of this podcast, I will have done everything that I wanted to do. And the Chris Voss show. It, it does complete you in That's a way. Right. That's what I hear. It does. It Tory... me. I'm still intimidated by the, the intro. Nobody said I had to be smart. <laughs> that was, that's a little, in, you know, kind of puts me on edge. 
You know, we had Dave Navarro on, the famed guitarist, the musician, and he was really, he was really kind of, he really liked it. He's like, am I in an MMA show or something? What's going on there? And it's always funny to watch people's faces during that intro. Uh, it does such a great job. Congratulations on the new book. Welcome to the show. Uh, give people, please, your dot coms, your plugs, wherever people can uh, go find out more about you on the interwebs. Well, the johngillstrap.com is, is sort of the, the hub for everything. My Facebook name is author John Gilstrap. No, that's not true. It's John Gilstrap author. It's my YouTube channel that is author John Gilstrap. So <laughs> just you, you type it in and I'll be there. There you go. There you go. So how many books have you written? Evidently, there's quite a few. I am now writing number 26. Wow. There you go, man. The prolific. See, sneaks I told you guys you. prolific. You know, one book at a time. It just kind of sneaks up over the years. There you go. I can't wait to get to that point. I just barely got my first one published. It wasn't a thriller, though. It was nonfiction, which is quite boring. But hopefully I'll wake up next year and I'll have 20 or something out. I don't know. <laughs> That's the pace. I'm, I'm doing one every 54 years at this pace. So, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. so what motivated you want to write this book? And I guess you have two. Let's clarify this for listeners. You have two different series going. The Jonathan Green grave thriller the jonathan grave thrillers on monday morning today and victoria emerson series going on correct mm -hmm. and so, so this is jonathan... go ahead jonathan grave is a freelance hostage rescue specialist and i've i've got i think i'm 15 books into that series or i'm about mm -hmm. to write number 15 in that series and more to the point of this show is the Victoria Emerson series, uh, Blue Fire. It was the second book in in that series. Crimson Phoenix was was the first. You ask what inspired it. There's that series, the Victoria series, is a post-apocalyptic series, but I'm not supposed to say that because these days post-apocalyptic means zombies. So there are oh. no zombies. You know, this mm. is these, this is just a, a very quick, deadly eight-hour war kind of knocked everybody back into the, the Stone Age. And Victoria Emerson is a former member of Congress from West Virginia. And she turns out, you know, as, as hundreds of millions of people die in this war, hundreds of millions of people survive. Yeah. And it, somebody's got to bring leadership to them. The government is hunkered down in a bunker. It's called the, the Annex, uh, which is based on a real place, actually. The, the original one was in um, White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, at a place called the Greenbrier Resort. Mm. And it's the place where members of the House and Senate, if the balloon went up, they would go to this underground bunker and try to run the country or what was left of the country. But the problem is they're not allowed to bring family. Yeah. And this place at, actually at the Greenbrier is open for a tour if you want to do it. It's a fascinating tour. So I think I've seen that where they extended the building. It's a white building, right? It's like an old hotel yeah. or something. Yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a huge, I think it, well, it dates back to the 1700s, but, but mm -hmm. that's not what that building is. Uh, it's one of those, you know, they got a skeet shooting range and croquet courts and you, know, you got to wear a tie for dinner, that kind of stuff. It, it's a cool place, but the Eisenhower administration started this, this bunker. Mm -hmm. And then the Washington mm -hmm. Post broke the story in 1994. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, hey, when the apocalypse come, man, it's it's everyone for yourself. And, you know, sometimes you got to settle all those family scores of people that, I don't know, took the turkey leg at Thanksgiving dinner. You know, you got to leave them behind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but, sure that's not yeah, in you, your book, by the way. <laughs> no, the turkey leg is not. But yeah. but the feral nature of people is, you know, we mm. just, look how people were killing each other over toilet paper in the early yeah. days of the pandemic. Can you imagine if there's no baby formula left? They still haven't found the five bodies in my backyard over the toilet paper, so you know, <laughs> I don't know what that means. Wait, are we are we live? Yeah, it, it's crazy. So in the in this book, this is the second in the series. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was just queuing you up. So uh, this is the this is what what goes on in this book, and and who who are who are our main characters that we're uh, chasing around. Okay. The first book in the series was Crimson Phoenix. So this is Blue Fire. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. next one will be White Smoke. I'm writing that now. So mm -hmm. in Crimson Phoenix is about the war itself and, and the early days. In Blue Fire, Victoria has sort of become the unelected mayor of this little town called Ortho, West Virginia, where she has brought order to chaos. Everybody's scared. Everybody's hurt. A lot, most everybody has lost someone they love. And she has established 
committees for security and for clothing, you know, as kids need more clothing as they get older, as the, the seasons change or whatever. So she has brought organization in the midst of a lot of chaos. And as Blue Fire opens, there's a National Guard unit out of Maryland that has cobbled itself together and they come to the town of Ortho to steal stuff. They call it, for, and it doesn't go well for them, but it, it, sets, uh, it sets up the violence of the time. You know, people, oh, wow. scared people are violent people and, and hungry people are violent people. So it's, it's sort of the, the chaos is trying to attack the, the calm, relative calm of Ortho. And Victoria is the natural leader. She doesn't want to be the leader, but that's where it settles out to kind of show people the right way. There you go. I mean, I, I get violent whenever I'm forging in the fridge if I'm hungry and people trying to get in my way. So <laughs> Where's that milk? <laughs> where's that piece of pizza that was there yesterday? Darn it. And my two dogs look at me and go, you took it. So where does the term Blue Fire, the title of your book, come from? Blue Fire is the code phrase for uh, bad trouble coming, whether it's mm. natural or human. And by... If, if somebody yells blue fire, it, it, it starts a, a cascading series of alerts that essentially everybody is a member of the militia here. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's time to go on alert and drive back whatever the problem is. Mm -hmm. And, Cr and Crimson you Phoenix, the first one was the code phrase for everybody's got to go to the bunker because the war is coming. Ah, now is that hell day as you refer in your book? Yes. Or hell day was the day of the war. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. that sounds like not a good day. That's it wasn't, and you know it's interesting. The sometimes I write fiction. I don't write politics. I don't work. I don't write about geopolitical anything. But sometimes the stars align oddly. The nuclear war that that caused all of this was started by accident when the United States was backing Israel's efforts to bomb Iran's nuclear capability. And uh -oh. the word leaked out ahead of time and everybody started shooting at each other and, and it blew up. So as we're recording this, uh, the, the whole the U Ukrainian, the awfulness in the Ukraine is uh, is going on. And it kind of feels a little uncomfortable at times. Like I, I, I cut a little clo too close to home. Yeah. Yeah. A good, I, I mean, it's a reminder of of how 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 you know stuff like this can happen i mean i was i was reading the washington post this morning kind of because i'm like I, I need to be prepared for when world war three breaks out so uh, this book might be a good instruction manual for what to do <laughs> well there's some of that you know it, the first thing if you hear the boom you have options if you don't hear the boom then well you know it's <laughs> i'm going to be screaming blue fire you don't matter anymore yes exactly blue fire That's blue true. fire yeah, there you go. So, what what so what are some other things you can tease out about the book? I know one of the things with novels is we can't, of course, give away the ending or much of the the middle part. What do you what, what are some thing maybe some adventures or some stories that maybe stick out to you that you can tease out to readers? Maybe. Well, I think the the lessons that I have learned by writing mm -hmm. the book, of, you know, going beyond the research of of you know prepping for things and, and all of that, which is which is interesting, but not particularly useful the nature of <clears throat> what makes society society you know mm -hmm. we we all agree that a piece of paper with a five on it is worth five dollars but without the backing of a treasury and without you know all of the the niceties of a society of a civilization it's just fuel for a fire so how do you engage in trade where mm. what what is useful currency because barter is about trading something I want for something you don't want and mm -hmm. for some kind of a premium in between. What about medicine? What about a toothache? What about clothing? You know, as if, you know, I grew three inches when I was 13 years old. So if whoever survives this, this apocalypse are going to be good for a few weeks, but then what happens as, as people need new stuff? Yeah. So it's, it's an exploration of the rebuilding of of a society in the midst of the the pressures from outside forces to to panic you know and mm -hmm. i learned a lot about that in fact i kind of want to emphasize since you're sort of on a book tour here this is not a dark book I mean, there are dark things mm -hmm. that happen in it but over mm -hmm. the overarching message is that you know hope and family 
Victoria has survived with her three sons. And, the, and what are you willing to do to protect your family? You know, mm -hmm. it's, and what do you expect your kids to do to protect themselves? Childhood becomes not a thing. Childhood becomes an age. The whole business of, I'm not talking toddlers, but once you get to be 12, 13, 14 years old, you know, you sort of got to carry your weight somehow. And you got to be yeah. able to survive and you got to protect yours. So those are kind of the explorations I've gone through. It's made the series a lot of fun to write. Yeah. So d did you do any, I mean, you kind of have a background on some of these things b between, you know, uh, working with weapons and uh, also your EMT work. That, was there any sort of other things you did to research? How do you reestablish, you know, humanity after after everything's wiped out and you have to reformulate everything? And then, and then like you say, you've got outside pressures of, you know, everyone fighting over everything. I didn't do a lot of research in that, quite honestly, as much as I did kind of step back and, and pretend. Mm -hmm. My fire service years were all about bringing order to chaos. Mm -hmm. And I'm very familiar with the responsibility. I was 23 years old and walk into the worst days of somebody's life. And they're looking, I am 911, right? So wow. they're looking for me to know what to do. And often I didn't, but you learn to fake it and to stay calm. And if you can fake the calmness and sell it, people settle down. I mean, it's kind of the yeah. essence of leadership, I think. And so I don't know if that's research or just kind of a lifetime of stuff coming together with an imagination where I think about this. I'm a child of the Cold War, you know. Mm -hmm. we, we, my, my dad was career Navy. We talked about, we didn't, but we talked about building a bunker in the backyard. Uh, that's actually going on again now evidently the, the bunkers are back and people are wanting to build them and buy them and that baffles me because <laughs> what about day two you know because I, I got all my stuff and i'm hunkered down and i have survived now what yeah what's what's the next step you got to come out of the bunker sooner or later yeah, you do. I mean, unless you got a lot of food, but I mean, nuclear stuff lasts forever. Well, yes and no, but but mm -hmm. it, yeah, you got to come out. What do you do when, I mean, as a practical man, now it sounds like a Twilight Zone episode, but what do you do if, if you've got gallons and gallons or pounds and pounds of, of, of baby formula and mm -hmm. somebody with a starving baby comes to your door? Are you really going to say no? I mean, yeah, it's an um, interesting prospect and if you do how do you live with those decisions because you we are social creatures it's another mm -hmm. theme that i explore in the books is you you've got to be a good person whatever that means to you and sometimes being a good person means you kill the other guy to protect your kid wow but to be cruel or to be a thief that's really bad yeah and, and you've got to try and build some semblance of society back into the i mean you've, you've got to work together you can't just you can't just go solo and rebuild society you know it's your own thing and so you you kind of deal with that how how society balances the needs of the many versus the needs of the few how to be an arbitrary of fairness do you want to talk a little bit about that i mean she's got what three teenage sons she's gonna uh, protect well, she's got, yeah, she's got her three teenage sons. One of them has, has a girlfriend who's pregnant. And it's, Victoria is very aware of the fact <clears throat> that people look to her for leadership. And mm -hmm. there's a speech she makes to her youngest son, who, they are living in a church, in, kind of in the, among the pews. And other people, the town is building houses for them, or huts, shacks, they call it shanty town. Mm -hmm. And Victoria makes the point that they can't build one for themselves because that's not what leaders do. Leaders help other people first and mm. then help themselves afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do with a thief? In, in Ortho, West Virginia, the fictional town, if you're a thief, you get a T carved into your forehead. Oh, really? Why? Well, you don't, you don't have the benefit of, of jails. That's true. And, and when you've got a, it's a zero sum game, you've got very finite, as finite resources as they can be. So if somebody takes wow. from Charlie, Charlie doesn't mm -hmm. have that thing. And rather than having Charlie go and kill Joe, making this up, the, the guy that stole, society punishes Joe in a way that will last forever and mm -hmm. will teach others that, well, maybe that's not a good idea. 
Kind of like a scarlet letter. Oh. That's pretty well, actually that was that was the benefit that was the the the, the what my thought when I came up mm -hmm. with the, the T. Yeah. But it makes sense. I mean, you can't like you say, you don't have any working jails, you don't have any sort of systems. You almost have to go to almost you know I don't, I don't know what the right term is but a penalistic society you know like like in islam sometimes they cut off your hands if you steal and different things like that i mean imagine in the, in a certain time of our medieval age you know that was necessary i guess the uh, so you know you you go through the book what are some other things that maybe you want to tease out as to as to their experience and and surviving and some of the conflicts they run into the 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 challenge, and again, I don't write politics, but the challenge of immigration. People mm. are are terrified. There are feral gangs out there who are preying on, on folks who are desperate. And word about Ortho, which people begin to call Eden, mm -hmm. leaks out. And people oh, want wow. to come in. Well, again, we get to the issue of finite resources. Mm. Victoria's view is that you, you can't just turn people away. But you also can't just give them gifts. So the way she works it out is everybody gets a week's worth of, of provisions. And it's and you're going to eat light with your provisions. And then after that, you're on your own. And you hmm. can join the construction committee. You can join the security committee. You can do something to earn your way uh, to, to prosperity, such as that would be defined. And they within the community have decided that ammunition is currency. It has value, it has immediate use, and it's West Virginia, so there's a lot of it. Yeah, there you go, and coal too. I don't know if you use coal in the book, but I had to put that joke in there. Uh, that, you know, that makes sense. I mean, there has to be an establishment of some sort of societal thing, and there has to be rules, and and it's kind of interesting how how you would start over something like that. You know, where do you begin? Where do you end? You know, you you you're using resources that you have to do now. Is the is the Congress still alive? Is the president still alive at this at, at a point in the story? Within the story, the Congress. Well, and this is based on the war plan that was that was revealed in the '90s. So I'm just imagining that it's probably kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. The different branches of government go to different shelters. And within the book, the House and the Senate go to the annex, this place at the Hilltop Manor Resort in West Virginia. And the president and vice president go to someplace else. Well, the president and vice president are killed in the war. Mm -hmm. So the presidency falls to the Speaker of the House, who is in the bunker, but not with the executive staff. He's, he's among a bunch of congressmen and senators, but he doesn't have a secretary of defense or anybody. So the, the machinations of government are another part of this story is, is how do you, what are, what strings are available to be pulled? The military is gone. All the military bases have, have been hit. They have the best communications equipment in the world and it functions, but there's nobody to hear it. You know, who are you mm -hmm. going to talk to? You're in a bunk. And it also gets into Blue Fire takes the next step of where the people who are outside the bunker learn that there is a bunker. Mm -hmm. And the people in the bunker have heat and three squares a day and a, and a doctor and showers and all of that, while the people are outside that don't have that. And they're squabbling among the politicians about, we need to tend to our constituents. And then there are those who are saying, well, we'll do that after 60 days when the doors open up and, and we can see what, what's out there. So it's just mass confusion. Crazy. Did you, did you go to the green buyer or the bunker now? I have, I've been there several times. In fact, yeah. and it's really worth the visit. So much of that was hidden in plain sight. In fact, I went yeah. to a conference there in the late eighties back when it was still the bunker and the blast door. I walked past the blast door four or five times. They've just, they've hidden it. They hit it with a one of those folding screens and really ugly mm -hmm. wallpaper because <laughs> nobody nobody was looking for a blast door. Right? Yeah. So, but it's a, it's a fascinating place. Plus, it's a, it's a great place to spend a weekend. It's really pretty cool, particularly in the wintertime. Yeah, if I'm thinking of the right one, they, they hid this for like 10 or 15 years by doing construction on it and made it look like it was like, you know, we're extending a wing of it or something. And they were, it, it, they were doing the underground or something. 
It was the West Virginia wing that they were building. Mm -hmm. It was authorized by the Eisenhower administration. And it was just an expansion of the facility. Now, mm -hmm. after the fact, a number of the locals have come forward and said that was a lot of concrete. You know, people <laughs> noticed that, that there's a lot of concrete going in. And they were told, you know, please keep it a secret. Don't tell people about it. And they didn't. Wow. And there were lifetime staffers working at that hotel who had no idea. Wow. In fact, the general manager was the only person on the staff who did know. And most Congress people did not know that it was there. Wow. That, that's it's pretty funny you know when when january 6 hit and they and they hid people you know they have places where they hide people in, in a case like that it's really wild how you know there's there's like little places they have for this sort of thing and somebody thinks this through and everyone's like we can't say where we were some people don't even know where they're at they're just like oh we're they we got taken a room and special room and and there you go it, and it's really intriguing some of the stuff i'm reading on their website you can go for 40 bucks you, you can go do the tour and stuff that'd be kind of fun to, to take and do but i imagine that helped give you a lot of reference points for your book it did <clears throat> and the just the infrastructure that they had to mm -hmm. feed 1100 people for minimum of 60 days they knew the prescriptions wow. of each member of congress so that they had fresh supplies this is in perpetuity right because it has to be replenished over over time so they 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 knew the eyeglass prescriptions they knew the 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 medicines and the allergies of each member of congress and they had it stocked there that's the crazy time. That's the one thing I've always thought about. If there was ever a, if there was ever some sort of apocalypse, I wear contact lenses. I don't have glasses, and I'd be like, and I every now and then I've thought, I don't know why, for some reason, I've just been kind of like, what if my contacts ran out? Like, where, where would I get glasses? I wouldn't be able to see. I'd be one of those blind guys in like the eighteen hundreds or something, or seventeen hundreds. They'd just be like, I don't throw meat at that dude over there. He has no idea what's going on. He can't see anything. But yeah, you think about these things, and of course, I you delve into these in the story and stuff. Let's see what else do we have here. About twenty five years ago, you put out your book, your first book, I believe, and uh, I can't find it in my questionnaire list here. And and that kind of kicked run. it. The Nathan's Run. There you go. T talk to us a little about that and how how this turned you into a prolific author well nathan's run was my first book it tells the story of a 12 year old boy who kills a juvenile detention center guard and escapes from the juvenile detention center mm -hmm. and he becomes the, the the talk of the world talk radio is just this is 1994 when i wrote it so talk radio is just kind of becoming a thing Mm -hmm. And people are calling for him to be tried as an adult. I mean, he murdered a law enforcement officer and the drumbeat that you can hear in the media today with things. And the reality is he killed in self-defense. We know this, mm -hmm. but nobody wants to hear that side of, of the story. Mm -hmm. So that's what Nathan's Run is, is about. I wrote it over the course of about four months. It was my fourth book, actually, that I had written. It was the first that sold. Mm -hmm. And it sold huge i mean we were featured in i was featured in publishers weekly and entertainment weekly and people magazine and is that it was that kind of that's awesome and from that came a movie deal that there has never been a movie i've been involved in seven movies right now and none of them have made it to the screen <laughs> hey those happened. option things are awesome from what i understand oh, they're like annuities yeah they just yeah. keep going and going yeah, just keep the people keep buying them and they spin them out and we have a lot of authors on the show and they're like yeah just you know, pay me for the for the option and you know one guy buys it and then another guy buys it and it's a pretty good deal and then if, we've had a it lot of people that turn on the thing so on and and now with the expansion of like amazon and netflix and disney and there's so many different you know stuff they're picking up that they're turning into great material it's just awesome so you know do you still have fans that have stuck with you through nathan's run i know that's a dumb question but it, i'm sure oh yeah i still hear from fans that tell me after 25 books i think nathan's run was the best <laughs> thing you ever wrote <laughs> really wow it's a, it's a lovely thing to hear it's a little disconcerting it's a little bruising to the ego but you know at least they like it <laughs> You're like, what? You know, that's that's the way it is with this thing. You know, yeah, everyone, the beauty of fan base is everyone has, you know, they like their different things. And, you know, it's kind of like Metallica. Everyone, you know, there's a there's half of Metallica fans, you know, before the Black Album and then after the Black Album. They're like, you sold out. 
And you know, it's you know, the, you get that with the fans. You pick it. Nathan's Run was just recently re-released a couple of years ago, oh. and which is wonderful. But I'll get an email from somebody that says on on page three hundred or two hundred and thirty, there's a typo. <laughs> you should fix that. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Thank you for for reading the book and for your input. Thank you. For, I mean, yeah, you know, they read the book. I mean, I kind of look at typos <laughs> that way. Yeah, hey, I know you read the book, so. Oh, we're good. We had we had one of the authors on the on the show. She's been on a couple times with us, and she's written I think about sixty six books. Let me see if I can find who it was. But she she um, it's J. A. Jance. If you're familiar oh, sure. with her oh, books, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yes. she's been on several times. She's always fun to have on because she just she just wants to do the show. Like I just turn over hosting to her, and and so she she told she, one of her favorite stories is one of her readers came up and told her. You know, do you know that your detective is an alcoholic? And this is like, you know, 10 books in or something. And she's like, well, really? And it never occurred to her. Do you, do you have people that come up to your on your books and, and try telling you stuff about your characters? It happens periodically. Not not that they're alcoholics. But you know what that means? It's, it's ultimately the a compliment. Because people are yeah. so invested in... In the characters, that they are kind yeah. of psychoanalyzing them or, or drawing conclusions. And the reality is, I mean, it sounds like writer's class shtick, and I don't mean it that way. But once I put a book out, you know, I put my heart and soul and, you know, all of talent such as that is into the book. But then everybody else's opinion of the character and everything else is, is equal to my own. So what I intended a character to be if it's interpreted as something else, that's not wrong. If somebody thinks mm -hmm. my character is an alcoholic, then I've somehow I have that's how it resonates with that reader, and their yeah. opinion is valid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes you might get feedback that I don't know. You're like, well, maybe we should do that with the character. And so it's always interesting the fan base. I mean, we have people that come running up to us and go, "The Chris Farr Show," and you're just like. I don't know who you are, but you're scaring me. So, and then you're going to continue to write your Jonathan Graves series? Yeah. In fact, I have one of those coming out. Uh, Lethal Prey. Nope. Excuse me. Lethal Game. It was mm -hmm. called Lethal Prey for a long time, and then we changed the title. So Lethal Game comes out in late June. There you and go. Then, there you uh, go. So I'm doing two books a year right now. That's, nice. I'm not sure how long I'm going to do that. That's a lot of writing. <laughs> It, it really is. We have authors that they just book like every six months to nine months and, and they're just like, they're just back and they, and like you, they're working on multiple series and it's quite prolific. I mean, I, I got to hand it to you, you know, after writing my first book, I'm just like, do I have to write another one of these things? So like, what is your book? It's called, it's called Beacons of Leadership. <laughs> it's a nonfiction book story of, you know, my business sort of thing. So, but, but just, just thinking about writing the second book. So seeing what you guys do, where you're constantly, you know, writing and writing and writing and boom and boom. It, I, I got to hand it to you. You guys are awesome. <laughs> why? Why? Thank you. It's yeah, my wife would it, disagree, but you know, that's, that's, <laughs> well, I think everyone's wife's that way. So this is pretty awesome. Anything more you want to tease out on the book before we go? No, I don't think I just, I want to emphasize, you know, the Victoria Emerson series in particular, Please don't be put off by what sounds like a dark subject matter. It is a thriller, mm -hmm. fundamentally, but it's, it really focuses a lot on rebuilding as opposed to the, the destructive forces, although obviously the destructive forces are there. It's been a lot of fun to write. There you go. And it should be fun to read. Give us your plug so people can find you on the interwebs. You can find me at johngillstrap.com on John Gilstrap Author on Facebook and and author John Gilstrap on YouTube. I have a Twitter account, but I don't use Twitter very often. Yeah, it's kind of a weird place over there on Twitter. It's kind of like boring. I can't. I don't understand it. It's too fast, and I, I just I really don't understand how Twitter works. There's a lot of toxicity over there and hard politics. So I don't know. I go over there just to I kind of catch up on news over there. That's pretty much what I go watch. A lot of great journalists that come on the show are over there, you know, and they're reporting news in real time. You know, half the time I, I try and watch news and we have a lot of CNN people on. I really respect uh, journalists. And but a lot of times I'll go on CNN. I'm just like, I saw this like 12 hours ago on Twitter. <laughs> so it's kind of fun well, you know, for that. 
a question. If you, next time you have a reporter like that, mm -hmm. one, ask a question for me. Are they really tweeting their own accounts or do they have staff that does that for them? Because I don't know how they can possibly have time I'm, to do their jobs and to constantly be on Twitter. You know, I never asked any of the journalists. I, I believe most of them are. You know, I, I talked to, we had John Avalon on from CNN a, a couple weeks ago. I, I talked, had a back and forth with what's his face an anchor in the daytime from CNN. He's been on the show and we were talking about another author that he was recommending. I said, oh, we had him on the show and we had a little back and forth there. I forget his name. It's, it's a Monday for me, but I think that they do. I don't. You know, but I could be wrong. There could be a whole army of of CNN, MSNBC, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. But you know, they're really down to earth folks. So I imagine they mm -hmm. they do. I know they have they have the people that watch their accounts and protect them. You know, sometimes they have either hackers that try and go after their accounts and you know stuff. But all, all in all, I'm just, just I, I gained a really deep appreciation for journalism by the guests we've had on the show. I mean, I always thought thought it was a good uh, thing. I think what's extraordinary to me that I love to talk about is, you know, they a lot of them carry the, the Constitution around with them in their pockets. They keep it with them. And part of it is the, you know, the freedom of the press aspect, but also just an appreciation for that document, which is uh, really important to this democracy, this experiment. So I always thought that's kind of interesting. <laughs> There you go. So next time, next time uh, one comes up, I'll ask. I'll ask if I'll be like, "Do you guys have like a hidden team somewhere?" You know. But you know, Elon Musk is like what the richest guy in the world, and and the SEC is kind of mad at him. His attorney, I guess they had a deal. His attorney is supposed to be reviewing his <laughs> tweets or something. So who knows? I just read in the Wall Street Journal this morning. I think he owns like. Elon Musk owns nine percent, I think, of Twitter, and yeah. he refused a board seat, a seat on the board of yeah. directors. And so there's a lot of of rattling of why, what, what's he planning? What's the you know the intrigue? He sure knows how to get people to pay attention to him. He can give him that, and he knows how to do really interesting things. Yeah, yeah. He's he's he knows how to work the people. So uh, you know maybe that's why he's a billionaire. What do I know? Clearly, I'm not a billionaire, so I'm not working the people, right? <laughs> so, I don't know. But continue success on your books, my friend. And please come back with the future ones. We'd love to feature you on those two as well. Thank I'd you for coming on the show. My Thank pleasure. you for coming Thanks on. Thanks for having me. There you go. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Voss. Uh, go to youtube.com for chess Chris Voss. It's free for an unlimited time. You just go there, you subscribe, and you have free access to like 4,500 videos or something that's over there. Also, go to all our groups Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and all that good stuff. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.